And now, coming to you live from Huntsville Atlantic Studios, it's Pop Culture Philosophers. And here are your hosts, Rockin' Robbie Billups and John Hammertime Horseshoe. Hey everybody, it's the Pop Culture Philosophers, coming to you live from Huntsville Attic in Huntsville, Alabama. Tonight we're going to be talking about 80s science fiction. We're talking about films, maybe maybe talking about TV shows a little bit, but our focus is on the films, the directors, and the great uh, special effects that came out in the 80s. I'm, of course, John Hammertime Holshue with me always, Rockin' Robbie Billups. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. This is an awesome subject, by the way. Oh, absolutely. 80s sci-fi. Come on. It's one of the best decades for science fiction, period, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. In film, at least. Oh, yeah. The film, man, I think they met like, they. it was like a peak of, of uh, like, just practical effects. Holy shit, man. Some movies, just mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, man. right? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here, John. I'm excited. And we have some awesome... Products of the 80s as well with us. You guys are all born in the 80s, right? Hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, just make sure. I don't know if I'd say <laughs> awesome, but they're with us. With us, as usual, Justin, just, Justin Goldsmith. <laughs> What's up? Justin, <laughs> Justin, Justin Goldsmith? <laughs> Justin. That was my Max Headroom oh. impression. See, get it? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. How really? you doing? How you doing, Justin? I'm pretty good. <laughs> good to hear you. Bringing <laughs> a, we did the sound check already. Yeah, we did. How about you? Jeremy Day, everybody. Jeremy Day's here. Oh, hey, I know you forgot my name for a second, but that's okay. No, I just started tanking on this whole introduction. I messed up Justin. I messed up you. I didn't forget your name. I just forgot what I was supposed to do next. <laughs> the thought was there, though. I know. Oh, man, it's, whatever. Yeah, it's great to be here. There, Jeremy is here yet again. I love it. And Robbie's stuff. defense, this, this is his first show. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It is true. But I'm super excited to be here with you guys to talk about 80 sci-fi. I know everybody here is a huge 80 sci-fi fan. I think John's going to ask a little bit about why. Why? <laughs> oh, I guess Robbie already asked the question. <laughs> why 80 sci-fi? Why do you want to be on the show? Why do you like 80 science fiction? Because there's some awesome stuff out there. Let's talk with Jeremy. Why did you agree to be on this show? Um, and then ditch out on the other shows, you son of a bitch. No, I'm kidding. Oh, wow. Well, no, thanks. thanks for being on the show, man. We're trying yeah. to get you on as often as we can. I know we talked about 80 sci fi and it's something you were down for. So thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for and having me. And why 80s sci fi? Was that, why was that particular subject matter that you wanted to join in on? Well, unreal. I didn't think about it, but most sci fi movies I really enjoy do come from the 80s. So that's probably why it's a lot. There's a lot of good films from then. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of ex- topics they started exploring, I guess, during that time that were more. I don't know. Getting they're trying to get woke, basically. Yep. And you were born in the eighties, right? So eighty yeah. sci and fi uh, films probably influential and, and, and I can't even say influential on you as a child. Like growing up, you saw these films. Yeah, like see, my mom let me watch a lot of good TV, so I guess I thank her for that. So I got introduced to sci fi early because I was born in eighty five, so right in the middle. You know, Back to the Future came out when I was born, so I came up on it late. <sighs> He's dating himself. How young he is? Is he? Oh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I'm like right in the middle. There you go. But I don't know. There's a lot of good movies I grew up watching. Of course, after they'd already come out, but like the impact was still there, I guess. Yeah, you watched it on VHS or whatever yeah. after uh, the fact. Blockbuster, man. Yeah. Before you know. Yeah, people of listeners don't know Blockbuster <laughs> was yeah. a video chain. It was once a thing. Most people know this, but there might be people listening that don't recall this. Yeah, you used to go to the store, rent a video. Goldsmith. Yes. Why 80s sci-fi? You're an actor yourself, too. You're a fan of science fiction. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're if you had any choice of a film you could be in you could pick the role would it be a science fiction film oh, probably yeah probably that's <laughs> took a, a little bit that's uh, a long that's a lot of it covers but it that. also covers a lot of bases yeah. really sci-fi is very open yeah uh, what it covers we well, got so. star trek so i guess yeah you'd be a, it's a pretty safe you'd be yes. one of the cap well i don't know if you'd be a gear enough to be a captain but well, <laughs> we'll see we've got this power stash does it have a, people, a great yeah, captain in the 80s we need to put a pic of this online but he does he's rocking the <laughs> 70s magnum power stash <laughs> robbie yes <laughs> why are you on the 80s episode other than you being the co-host of the show but it was you and i that discussed this how a great topic oh, yeah. this would be well first of all nostalgia right because those are the movies that that we grew up with we grew up watching back to the future and et and 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 and, and then things like the thing and, and stuff like that right so we have that idea but i think they're so great in particular from that decade because this was the first time that technology really could meet the level of some of these ideas that some of these visionary creators had, right? Like technology now, you had movies like Star Wars, Blade Runner that were really advancing special effects in movies, movies like Aliens and The Thing that had amazing creature work, things like that. So lots of awesome technology 
being able to really finally explore these ideas and these things oh, yeah. on an on an epic scale. Yeah, practical effects were at their their peak really, and we're also starting to get into some CG. CG is, CG was introduced in the seventies, but really came to be in big way in the eighties. Not always for the better, but really started to really show up in movies a lot more in the eighties. So a couple of the worlds that stand out to me, like Tron, you know that that world that was created with CG. What are some worlds, uh, Goldsmith? that stand out in your mind that you would want to be a part of or that you just love from the 80s? Um, not entirely sure if I'd want to be a part of it, but the the when I think of a world that was built in the 80s, you got to go straight to Blade Runner. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Because that's, that's like one of my favorite parts of 80s sci-fi in general is the... the the culture in the 80s was there was a lot of neon lights and stuff like just the style that everybody wore and built buildings and stuff yeah. like that in there's a lot of neon lights and stuff like that and it really their vision of the future with all that base i guess not like their base culture in the 80s projected forward yeah is just really kind really of cool. cool and does it i mean it seemed believable at least though right i mean they took yeah. it took the 80s and they kind of <clears> ran <throat> with it but it was sort of a believable future. Even today, I think for the most... I mean, we've moved on some things. Yeah. But at the, at the time, you wouldn't want to live in that world. Or what, what 80s science fiction world would you want to live in? Uh, live... Um, I guess I got to go with Star Trek again. Is your answer going to be Star Trek for everything? For, Except for the one where you world? sneak in fucking Quantum Leap. I know that's what it's going to be. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just about to mention Quantum Leap a minute ago. <laughs> that's not... <laughs> um, which their style, by the way... For 1999 was just fantastic. All the clothes that Al wore with the crazy suits and stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. Star Trek. Robbie. <laughs> yes. I know you're a big Blade Runner fan, so obviously Blade Runner. Uh huh. But what uh what what worlds do you do you enjoy admire? Which ones would you want to be a part of? Well, I wouldn't want to be a part of this one, but the world that is set forth in the movie Aliens to me is very believable and very mm -hmm. real. And I, I like the concept because you, you do have things like, for instance, the world I would want to live in, I, I agree with Justin, it's Star Trek. Yeah. Who doesn't want to live in pristine, clean space vessels and explore the galaxies, right? And uh, But like in Alien and Aliens, which is the 80s, like it's, it's gritty and it's dirty and space doesn't seem very, very glamorous. You know, it's like space travel, and it's not really done for exploration purposes. It's done for mining, and yeah. and the aliens aren't there to like make peace with us or like to have cultural differences. They're there to eat us, and to you know spread babies in, in our chests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of what I was gonna say about the their '80s view. Like some of the stuff from the '80s looks more futuristic than what we have now. Absolutely, our future is evolving kind of boringly. So yeah. <laughs> And, and just as far as the design of the world, I love Blade Runner, like Justin yeah. was saying. That's an amazing one. But I would rather live in Star Trek. I mean, food replicators, transporters. Yeah, you're right. Everything. Yeah. I feel like I wouldn't fit in. I'm not a clean cut. You know what I'm saying? Have to be clean shaven. All the, you know, perfect hair, perfect posture. You're right. Everything's so clean. I don't even think those motherfuckers poop. I just everything's so clean. Oh, they poop. <laughs> <laughs> What a weird I, know, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> what? I've been there. <laughs> Jeremy, is there a 80s world that stands out in your mind or one you want to talk about? And, and which one would you want to live in? Um, I'd say the Blade Runner world is really awesome to look at. I don't know if I want to live in it either. Because, I mean, it seems rough. <laughs> it seems really rough. I mean, Everybody's you don't know who's in. human. You don't know who isn't. You, know what, you don't know what non-humans are out to get you. Yeah, you'd be a replicant, by the way. Oh, man, come on, dude. <laughs> Why me, though? <laughs> no, you, mm -mm. But anyway, <laughs> back back to my opinion here on Blade Runner and its world. Uh, it's an okay world. It looks really all, like the opening scene of Blade Runner when they're just zoom when they come over all the buildings and stuff, and you get that very panoramic view yeah. of what the, the city looks like. Oh, so sick. But um, no, do not want to live in. Uh, live in? I don't, can I say Star Wars? I know it came oh, out. Oh, yeah. This, okay, it yeah, came so, out in the 80s. So, There's so, like, two Star Wars films in the 80s. I'm going to be the other star guy. No Star Trek, but Star Wars. Because yeah. the Force, man. I mean, I'm if I could definitely if I could get Jedi powers, but you can't in this scenario. You can't. You work in one of those cantinas. <laughs> You're one of the oh no! <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that's okay. You get to see really interesting people yeah. come through. You, see, I mean, <laughs> you get to see like some dude get his arm hacked off, and then another guy get shot, and it's very cool. You know, it's interesting. It is a pretty fantastic world that. Uh, George Lucas created yeah, in, in in the design. I mean, there was a lot of people involved in that. Yeah, besides just George Lucas, but you're right, it's fantastic. I'm talking about like special effects when they started getting really awesome. That's a really good example. Star Wars. What about you, John? 
I would well the one that I'm most enamored with, obviously, from the 80s, is the Tron world. But I don't know if I want to live in the Tron world, to be honest with you. I mean, I'd like to have a room in the house look like Tron at the flick of a switch. If I could like, leave, that'd be cool. yeah. If I could leave Party the Tron time, world everybody. and come back of my own choosing, then yeah. yes. Otherwise, I don't know. Maybe the 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 Star Wars universe is pretty badass. I know it's not really. I mean, it's science fiction, but it's not really futuristic. It's just an alternative, but. There's some crazy cool advances in science. All right, so you'd like to live in that world, but what if you live on the planet that Luke was on? They got blown up. And Last <laughs> Jedi, and uh, you have to like drink that milk and, and all that jazz goes along with it. Or would you rather be in a clean spaceship with food replicators and You know what? I'm taking it all back. I want to live in the computer. <laughs> Let's go back to the Tron. I'll just live in the computer. They just drink the energy or whatever in the first one, like the, the liquid. They get those cool fucking bikes. Let's do Tron. The grid. Yeah, you know, we briefly touched on this, Justin, earlier when we were mentioning this. But you were talking about how, like, just the vision from the '80s carried on to the sci-fi of the time. Yeah. Right. So, what are some of the common themes and motifs in these movies? Because obviously, they share a lot of themes from just '80s movies in general, and of course, of course, <laughs> um, themes from science fiction movies in general. But because of the the uniqueness of the '80s and the uniqueness of sci-fi, it m- meshed into this. Really awesome thing that to me like speaks of a a bleak future. That's kind of like, and a lot of this is reflected from things like corporate greed, movies like Wall Street and stuff like that, yeah. and distrust of the government because of things like the Cold War and stuff like that. So this bleak future, this distrust of the government, the rise of computers and the yeah, cyberpunk, machines, the yeah. cyberpunk genre, um, this this dark dystopian, dirty, gritty view of the future that seemed to permeate the pop culture. Of the 80s. Any common themes you want to mention, talk about, elaborate on? Things that fan, uh, fascinate you? Well, the <clears throat> the advent of computers really got humanity thinking about, like, when the idea of artificial intelligence got brought up, the it really became a big deal. Like, what is it to be human? Like, could we make a computer that is also human and stuff? And there's a lot of stuff in the 80s, sci-fi in particular, where you have that either an android or a replicant like in Blade Runner. Um, there was the movie we watched earlier, Jeremy, uh, Slipstream, has a android in it. A and classic of the genre. Yeah, and it's... it's it's A lot of the themes are what does it mean to be human? I mean, even in Star Trek, but the movies and the next generation when it started. And definitely if you think of the culture in America, especially in the 80s, there is this very much of, what is my identity? How do I fit in this this crazy? Things were getting yeah. fast. Things were speeding up. Um, cocaine was a rampant drug. <laughs> AIDS was happening. It seemed very overwhelming culturally at that time. You know, what I remember as a kid, it all, the outside world seemed very, very scary. I preferred, you know, my comic <laughs> books and baseball games. What about yeah. you, John? What are some of the themes that, that you pick up on from the uh, 80s science fiction? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Say the more that the the computers the the you not only seen like we said CG start really showing up in films, but then there were stuff of you know rising machines, robots, what the future could bring, and it was always in the films really like terrible future. <laughs> like there's going to be robots that look like shows. Terminator is a big example of that. So here's the rise of a computer, and then of course it takes over, and then it sends a machine back to kill somebody who's the only hope. So that kind of combines them not only the machine but the rise of the computer. So you got stuff like. You know, War Games was War Games 70s, I remember. Oh, War Games is 80s, right? Okay, yeah, so yeah. then you get computers like... There was definitely people who were scared of what computers could bring because 80s also brought... Uh, and, and this doesn't really do a film, but the the personal computer was... That was the rise of the first personal computer. You got IBM introducing the personal computer. You've got Commodore. You've got Apple. You've got Atari, who made computers back then. So everybody was getting to the personal computer business and so there was this threat that these machines were going to advance and become far more than they would. Of course, you know, likes of Commodore and Atari aren't around anymore. But people were deathly afraid of what these could be, especially older people who had, you know, this uh, were really kind of cynical. Then I don't understand the Commodores are confusing. Yeah. And, and, you know, everything that you were just talking about. <laughs> not the band, the Commodores. They were not confusing. <laughs> Even that was the, the first thing I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Even the video game influence um, and, and just this distrust of technology and the inherent evilness of technology, uh, a lot of those themes are present in one of your favorite movies, Tron, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, you're battling an evil computer program. You know, you had to go in there and stop it. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it leads yeah. me to believe that, because I was talking about distrust of the government, it's really just a distrust that that's prevalent in these 80, whether it's technology, whether it's it's artificial intelligence, whether it's, a tech, you know, I already said technology, whether it's the government's. Because um, look at these movies, like in, in, in Blade Runner, like, 
we don't trust ourselves to give ourselves a good future, it seems, in some of these movies. Jeremy, what do you think about some of the themes that stand out to you in 80s science fiction? One that really stands out to me is, I guess, um, like it, transhumanism, kind of. Well, I don't know if this fits in that, but basically they advanced humans, humans that are better than the average human. That's a big thing because you get movies like Scanners, Firestarter, Akira, um, yeah. any like psychic powers and stuff like that. Stuff that makes people like just better than other people, like how to achieve that next step of human up, uh, human evolution. Yeah. Like just either artificially or just through like I don't know, meditation, any kind of means to like advance us as a species. That comes up a lot in film, I think, then. Um, a lot talk. of this comes up in the 80s. You think that's because of the rise of technology and, and just we thought we, how we could use like our further knowledge now to, to advance ourselves? Um, it's almost like we didn't trust. If we didn't trust ourselves to give ourselves a good future, we would we would create it using you know, like, like eugenics or like you know like you know genetic manipulation and like a more direct approach, kind of instead of like through like uh, like Van Damme or something like Van Damme and Cyborg. Yeah, or like just enhancing ourselves in other ways instead of just building something. Like it's the other side of that coin. There's machine intelligence and stuff. We built something that could become God, or we could become God. It's like which side do you choose? And that comes up a lot in 80s uh, sci-fi, I think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> I think we covered a lot of that right there. And the coolest thing about the 80s sci-fi is, like, you're taking all this stuff about the overwhelmingness of 80s culture, the fast-paced uh, rise of the business world, the corporate greed, and, and the Cold War, and, and Reaganism, and Reaganomics, and just the, this, the, 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 the richer got richer and the poorer got poorer. You know, that really kind of, like, started and start, that gap really started widening in the 80s economically. And then... I think that gave rise to this vision of the future where it would just be like the rich have like look at all a lot of these movies and like the rich are like right there the one percent like have everything and then everybody else lives in squalor basically in the future and it's like a and then the control mind control 1984 stuff like that that really starts kind of coming through and I know 1984 wasn't written in 1984 but uh <laughs> but yeah some really cool stuff but what happens because of these themes and these motifs and all of this stuff it gives rise to some of the greatest heroes in science fiction cinema history, I think, John. Some of the best. Some of the greatest. Some of the ones that I had on posters in my wall when I was a kid, actually. <coughs> I'm going to start with Goldsmith. Some of the 80s heroes that stand out in your mind are some of your favorite. Robocop. Robo motherfucking cop. What it's a like, badass. Not the shitty one in the new movie. The badass silver one played yeah. by, what was his name? Uh, Peter, Peter Weller. Weller. Peter Weller, man. Peter. He's a poster child of 80s sci-fi. Yeah, apparently, because he's in, what is it, Trancers? What's the one with the things that like the things that come out of the ground and get you? Tremors? Tremors? No, it's not Tremors. <laughs> well, the 80s, <laughs> they're, like, they're like blades that come out. He's in that movie. Anyway, he's in a Screamers? bunch of... Screamers? He Screamers. He was in Screamers. That's uh. a Philip K. Dick story. Yeah, he's in a bunch and of... Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah, and Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah. So he's in a bunch of 80s. Yeah, so yeah, Robocop, yeah. man. Robocop. Awesome. Uh, Snake Plissken. Oh man, how far I forgot about Snake, man. Yeah, you can't can't sleep on Snake. Yeah, and He'll talk about you. Kurt Russell. Talk <laughs> about like a hero of the eighties, man. Kurt Russell. Yeah. Kurt fucking most Russell. glorious some of the most glorious locks of all time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Growing up that the guy's head. Head. even today. Yeah. yeah. And the eye patch. Eye patch makes anybody more badass. I thought you were gonna say iPad, and I was like, those went around the eighties. <laughs> 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 what about you, Robbie? There's some heroes you want to talk about? Um in the eighties, some iconic ones. Well, you know, Justin mentioned RoboCop, and that's played by Peter Weller, but mine is Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> I think Buckaroo Banzai is one of the absolute coolest characters in science fiction history. I love that movie. Does he play immensely. a Stratocaster? I don't know, but he plays guitar. He's in a band. <laughs> he's he's like I mean he's he's like a, a test pilot. He's a scientist. He's like a, a philosopher. He's he's just the coolest dude, and he's like a, a true Renaissance man. And he's got this this crazy background where like his mother was. Wasn't his mo- or his father was Asian and his mother was was a cowboy, or vice versa? So that's why he's Buckaroo Banzai, and I just it love it. <laughs> it's so cool, and it was to me, it's still one of the closest things to the quirkiness of the celebrity of the science hero that is in things like that I love, like uh, like the Fantastic Four and stuff like that. And Peter Weller back then would have been a hell of a Reed Richards, but oh yeah, he would have been perfect. An, an honorable mention, though, very close is Spock. I think Spock really grew as a character. I mean, he was awesome in the uh, the original series, but in the '80s in those movies, yeah. we came to love Spock like we never would have I mean, ever dude, before, right? The '80s, you had uh, Wrath of Khan. Yeah, you had Wrath of Khan. You had Search for Spock. Yeah, I mean, just the Spock grew so much in the public conscious 
in the 1980s yeah. because of brilliant performances by Leonard Nimoy. All right. Jeremy. Villains. Oh. Not villains. Wow. Oh. Why would you look at me and say villains? What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> it's messed up. <laughs> Your heroes that you want to talk about that you really liked from the 80s. Okay. Marty McFly. Marty. Like, yeah. Marty McFly. I was waiting for somebody to bring that I up. I mean, he gets thrown into a very tumultuous situation and he deals with it pretty well. Yeah, he almost he's slept like, with his mom. It's like, hey, man, <laughs> this this crazy doctor. Yeah, he did. That's a really crazy situation. But he's like, hey, this crazy doctor I just happened to hang out with just invents time travel and <laughs> dies. Was, was, why was he hanging out with I the crazy know. doctor? The, the, okay. the other day, somebody was asking about that. Like, why? There's no back. Like, who was. Does. Oh, it was John Mulaney. He was like, who? They, they just walked in and pitched this. Like, okay, so there's this guy. He's going to high school and he's friends with this disgrace nuclear physicist <laughs> like, like how what? this happened i think <laughs> they, i think they set up why they're friends in the beginning i think it's because he's got that sweet ass amp set up i mean oh, yeah. i guess that's ki- why didn't kill himself with that but okay he's like well you know you got a really sick speaker and amp set up here you know maybe if i can just use that we could be friends and you can have a young friend to keep you cool but either w- anyway what i'm saying is Mario fly <laughs> is the hero he's i don't know and then he deals with like you know getting thrust into the past Meeting his parents, almost having sex with his mom, kind of weird. Um, saves the day, keeps his family alive, makes sure his like the McFly lineage continues. I don't know. He's a good hero. Uh, honorable mention, I guess. It's Snake Pliskin, of course. Yeah. I mean, snake. yep. He does. Call it. me Snake. Call me Pliskin. Call me Pliskin. But uh, yeah, the eye patch, the good hair, whatever. But I'll bite. Um, <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, Luke Skywalker. Oh yeah, yeah, man, Luke Skywalker. Nice, Luke. nice, nice. What about you, John? That's what I was mentioning. Is Luke, man, when he comes back, Return of the Jedi, he's such a badass. He's oh, yeah. all dressed in black, and he's just shows up. You know, at the beginning, you're like, oh, Luke's back, and oh wait, he's super bad. At first, you think he's not, and he is. He's super badass. Super On the badass. top of that, Tron, man. He's even got the name of the film. People always remember Jeff Bridges. Tron is the superhero that saves the day. Of course, Tron is the program created by Bruce Boxleitner's character. I forget, remember his name in the movie. He creates. I, I like how the characters it's all Guillermo. look like. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> so he creates. He creates Tron to go in and and, and destroy, uh, the uh, the MCP or whatever. Or go find it. Anyway, he fights for the users. I don't know. Just Tron's a bad. The Master Control Program, right? Tron, right? Yeah. Is that what the MCP? Yeah, yeah. yeah. MCP yeah. Master yeah. Control for Yeah. So Tron is super badass. Of course, <laughs> we won't go into how he becomes Rinsler and becomes a bad guy in the sequel, but whatever. Tron. Other than that, Luke, man. We already said Luke. Luke's badass. You know, I'm surprised nobody said Yoda. I left Yoda out because I thought someone would say Yoda. I'm going to say Yoda. Yoda, man. Yoda's dope. He's just a goddamn Muppet. Yeah, and it's dope. Yeah, he's awesome. I That's love messed Yoda. up. Yeah, I more than Yoda. a Muppet. Yeah, I was just trying to rile up the Star Wars. I like Star Wars, man. No knocking it. So, and I, I, Yoda's badass. So, those are some of our favorite heroes. When we come back, we may be talking about some of our favorite villains. <laughs> I we to may my, be. I maybe stepped in my, <laughs> my own foot earlier. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in. This is 80s Sci-Fi. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Rock and Robbie here. I want to talk to you real quick about our YouTube channel. You got to get on YouTube, find Pop Culture Philosophers, and subscribe. There you will find the weekly comic book review, new comic book reviews every single week, also the weekly pop culture wrap-up. It's also the only place you can find the Rockin' with Rockin' Robbie podcast. And we just launched a brand new show called Movie Monday. Every Monday, a new video. We're going to be talking about movies, and we are starting with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, everything from Iron Man all the way up to Avengers Infinity War. That's right, Movie Monday every Monday on our YouTube channel, as well as the weekly comic book review and other such favorites and surprises along the way. So check us out at youtube.com slash pop culture philosophers. Welcome back to (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back to Pop Culture Philosophers. The only show online that's 100% gluten-free. 100%. No other show can You've say that. You've used that joke before. I have used that, and it's, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Check our sticker on the box. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, we're talking about 80s science fiction, and we're going to continue. We just talked about heroes. Now we're talking about villains. Villains. There's some iconic ones, super iconic. I think the 80s had some of the best, most original villains. I, and I feel like I'm talking shit about new movies, but it really feels like 
there's a couple original villains, but it feels like the 80s kind of like had the best of the best. I think the best of the best was a film. <laughs> I think like a kickboxer film. Yeah, but not a science fiction film. It's not a science Starring fiction film. The, uh, the glamorous Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts? Yes. Speaking of Eric Roberts, we got our very own Eric Roberts here, Justin Goldsmith. <laughs> who are your favorite? Who are your favorite '80s villains, or ones that stand out in your mind? Uh, from science fiction. <laughs> from science fiction, yeah. Specifically, this is '80s sci-fi. So if you bring up one from like, I don't know, not science fiction, I'll punch you in the dick. <laughs> Rick Moranis in Spaceballs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dark yes. helmet. Dark, Dark, Dark helmet. helmet. That's one of the best from the '80s. Um, the Skynet. For real. Oh, just Skynet in general. Yeah. yeah, badass. And, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger with that. I think my favorite... The T-800. I think my favorite ensemble cast, uh, villain cast, is from uh, RoboCop, though. Kurtwood Smith, the guy who played the dad in that 70s yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Miguel Ferrer and uh, Ronnie Cox, who was the, the captain, Bogomil in uh, Beverly Hills Cop. They're a very intimidating group to be villains. Who's the one against. that gets their face melted off? Is it the? It is the guy from the '70s show. It's. I can't remember. It's been an, a year or oh, so okay. since I watched it. Oh, the original is awesome, man. It it's definitely got its <laughs> bizarre sense of humor, but the original yeah. holds up really well, and the special effects look good yeah. in the first one. The second one, uh, the uh, the other robot. I forget the second robot. Uh, the one that the T one thousand. No, <laughs> what the one that like nuke or whatever. It needs that drug. I forget the name of it. Some of the uh, stop motion effects look dated, but one. Oh yeah, but one holds up incredibly well, incredibly well. You know, that was a cool toy though. That, that oh, other was. one in part two. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. still like ED two hundred nine or whatever Ed two hundred nine with the robot from the first one is my favorite. Yeah, and the robot that they got to play Peter Weller was really really good. <laughs> Peter Weller. <laughs> Peter Weller. <laughs> the robot that they built. They built oh, you Robocop. mean the practical effect? Yeah, he oh, just did mean, the voice. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I'm never calling on you again. <laughs> Just unplug his mic. What are your, some of your favorite villains? Robbie. Uh, Roy Batty from Blade Runner is number one. Like that moment when he's dying, spoilers, and he has the dove in his hand and he's, not, and he's talking and it's raining and he's like, these memories will fade in time like tears and rain. Yeah. And, What's that actor's uh, name again? That is Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer. And one day soon we will be doing the Rutger Hauer Power Hour. We've mentioned this a lot before. We're, we're building it up. Yeah. All It'll right. be a 30-minute show. <laughs> no, but I love his performance in that movie. He's a very intimidating villain, mm -hmm. and he's a very complex villain that you totally feel for. And it, and in a way, he's kind of the good guy. By the end of it, he kind of comes across to me as more of a hero because he's fighting for something. He's fighting for the right to live. Yeah. And Deckard is 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 a murderer. You know, when and you got like, a job to do. Yeah. Aside from that, dude, the Emperor from Star Wars, man. Palpatine. Oh, yeah. When yeah. he shows up for the first time in Jedi, like when you see him, just like the hologram of him or whatever in Empire, that's like, you're like, whoa. When he shows up, like, dude, that's so. <laughs> <With> the monkey eyes, <laughs> orangutan face. <laughs> well, they, well not, the, they, the, the original one was different, remember? Because now, you like, they, they put, they redid it. Yeah, and they put the new actor in. Yeah, well, it's the same actor, but. No. Well, and it was a different actor in, the, in Empire. But the guy that played the Emperor in Jedi, Ian something is the guy that played him in the prequels. Which is also yeah. the same Emperor from Emperor's New Groove. And then they, did, <laughs> they did put Christ. him in Emperor. Anyway, but when he shows up in Jedi, when you're a kid, like I would watch those scenes over and over, that voice, take it, strike me down with all of your anger. Like, dude, I love him. He's so ugh, awesome. I remember you watching over and over, and you're like, take it, take it. And you, I was like, Robbie, why are your pants <laughs> Way to Way to, way to bring the show up a few levels, John. <laughs> We have to wear monocles now. <laughs> <laughs> Class of the show. Jeremy, are there some villains that stand out in your mind from 80s science fiction movies? Uh, Skynet. <laughs> Fucking Skynet. I mean, it's a computer program that goes crazy and just causes all these troubles for humanity. It's like, it even goes to the past to ruin us. It's like, oh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Skynet. What's going on? Um, That's pretty smart of it, though. Be like, oh, we can't stop this person? What if we went in the past? Yeah, what if we just went back up. and just ruined it when it was a lot easier? It's like, they have less technology then. They're easy to take out. Um, Darth Vader. Like, every iteration, anytime he shows up, it's just, you know it's going to go down. 
He's like, I'm <laughs> shit's going down. Yeah, guys. Vader's badass. Yeah. I always thought, and I still think the Star Wars villains are so much cooler looking than anybody on the good side. Like the villains have the best costumes. They clearly look like villains. It's like <laughs> yeah. that guy because they've that's got the bad guy. cool. Don't take this the wrong way, but they've got cool Nazi uniforms. <laughs> I mean, because those do look good. It does evoke as bad as they are. It does evoke certain in- imagery, I think, and that's probably what they're going for. Is that? Yeah. Sure. And um, the good guys are wearing like literally rags. I mean, like <laughs> you can. There's a clear distinction between the good and the bad people in Star yeah. Wars. You know who's gonna go like and just ruin someone's life um other villains oh the xenomorphs from aliens yeah. oh yeah especially yeah. the queen yeah oh the, the aliens just you, yeah that's a really good scene the culmination is stuff when you finally see the queen and everything it's like oh man oh boy it's not gonna go good for anyone here and but yeah just acid blood we can't even kill them without getting killed how do we how do we go about this but yep. yeah as much as alien was a great horror film aliens builds up that it's such a great action sci-fi film and there's just so yeah. much more aliens yeah there's more You're right man and they're great villains <laughs> aliens themselves are great villains i'm gonna throw in besides them um sark from tron played by david warner who was also the bad guy in uh uh what do you call it? time bandits he was the, the evil guy in time bandits and then uh we were talking about terminator earlier the, but the t-800 himself <laughs> arnold is so intimidating he himself is such an imposing character so having him be the big evil robot the t 800s from robocop 3 what shut the <laughs> <laughs> so uh uh and then of course uh ed209 the second the robot from uh the first robocop um the big the big one that shoots that scared the shit out of me as a kid i probably shouldn't have been watching it but remember he's like put the sick put the gun down he drops the gun you know it's like a test and he's like put the gun down and he's like i'm got the gun's dropped and he just fucking mows down that guy <laughs> was that was the one that was like a mech looking thing yeah yeah you know? he like shoots yeah. the executive just mows him down and then last <laughs> but not least the thing man how about villains yeah the thing is scary as shit yeah and just oh man isn't it just like a pathogen it just infects things. It's a like a pile of oil. Yeah. Well, it, it <laughs> replicates. It replicates. Yeah. It replicates its host. Yeah. So I don't know what its true form is. It's like a pathogen, though. So, it just infects things. Yeah. I always wondered if the ship crashed and it's from that ship. That ship could be not the ship of that alien. That might be the ship that he infected in the first place. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. We we it's definitely an alien, but we don't know if it's an alien of that. You know what I'm saying? That could be a different species in the first place that he replicated. It could go back further than that. That's a good fan theory. True enough. You so. know, one of my favorite things, John, about the thing is the music involved. Ennio Marconi oh, yeah. did such an amazing yeah. job. Smooth. Yeah, right. like it's smooth great, transition. smooth music, right? <laughs> yeah, we talked about him on the <laughs> Westerns podcast. We did, right? And that's why John Carpenter got him, of course. Of course, John Carpenter himself uh, is, knows a little bit about composing a film score. I think one of my favorite... Music, uh, one of my favorite soundtracks and scores in 80s science fiction is Escape from New York by John Carpenter. Yeah. I think that one's really good. I love Howard Shore's work on Videodrome. Haunting, creepy, cool, orchestral stuff mixed with synthesizers. It's amazing. But I think the top big daddy of all 80s science fiction movie scores would be Blade Runner by Vangelis because I love that score. It is majestic. It is epic. It is of the time, but it still feels futuristic and retro. I love it so much. Justin, since you agree, mm-hmm. what are some of your favorite scores and music from 80s science fiction? Dude, without a doubt, Blade Runner number one. I listen to that all the time. Yeah, no joke. Me too. <clears throat> uh, you got your Star Trek music. It's always good. Jerry Goldsmith. Mm-hmm. Un- uh, unrelated. Present, Sad. I think. Sadly. Um, Star Wars music, of course. But... Um, so non, one. non, so just like pff, Star Wars music, of course. Yeah, move yeah. it, move it. Yeah. Um, oh, the Terminator music. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like when you hear <laughs> those <laughs> noises. Those are the worst representations. <laughs> <of it. laughs> it's not even really music at the beginning, but whenever you hear it, you know what it is. Yeah, and it really kept. It really captures the tone of that yeah. film. Oh yeah, the, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The actually, deal. yeah, really good. And then the Back to the Future theme is oh, like the most Back heroic. You talking about Power of Love? No, <laughs> just the, the score. Is so. Johnny, be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's really good music. Super heroic. Yeah. and they change. I love that they change with each movie with the era that they're in. So like yeah, the Western do, one yeah. is more. Yes. Yeah. But Power of Love is great too. Yeah. Yeah, Huey Lewis, Johnny be man. Good. Talk about a staple of the '80s, man. Huey yeah. Lewis in the news. Speaking Iconic. of speaking of the news, <laughs> what about you, John? Has anybody talked about Back to the Future? Yet? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, man, Back to the Future. Not only, like you said, the score, but Huey Lewis has multiple songs. <laughs> and Huey Lewis is in the damn movie. He's the teacher. You guys are just too loud, man. <laughs> I saw some back to, uh, behind this Back to the Future, behind the scenes thing where they're 
Marty was learning the riff. I guess uh, Michael J. Fox knew a little bit of guitar, and they like taught him that riff. So he plays when they're doing the tryouts or whatever. He actually did play that on a guitar. I saw him being taught. And uh, and I think even Huey Lewis gave him some pointers. Even though Huey plays, he's not really known for playing. I think he's more a lead singer. Um, besides that, man, uh, yeah, Back to the Future. So uh, talk about Terminator. Um, Star Wars, obviously. Uh, that's uh, John Williams. Star Wars, obviously. Yeah, it's such, but John Williams that. is such a great... I think, seriously, the best film composer of all time is John Williams, by far. Mm. I mean, he's done so many films. Bold. He's so iconic. But he's also done so many different films. And some of his stuff may sound similar. Obviously, uh, Superman, Star Wars. But then you got some other stuff that's completely out there and different and still stands out. Like, Jaws doesn't feel like Star Wars, for example. But yeah, it's very original. I know Jaws is a different era, but John Williams is just such an iconic... Oh, and, and in later yeah. movies, especially like things like Catch Me If You Can... And uh, Munich, things like that. He's is more subtle yeah. scores. That, uh, there's John Williams is a fantastic yeah. composer. And the last one I mentioned is one of my favorites. I don't think anybody else is going to mention is Wendy Carlos, who did the Tron soundtrack, the original. People love Tron Legacy because Daft Punk kills it, and they do. But dude, the original Tron, it's got a great. And then of course it's got that song from Journey in it. Yeah, are you are you trying to say that Daft Punk literally killed the Tron franchise, and that's why they're not doing it? No, anymore? no, that movie was great, and Daft Punk attributed contributed to being a great film. No, but, but that Journey song, you ain't kidding. Yeah, that Journey song is great, but Wendy Carlos does all the the soundtrack, and it's got that electronic. I mean, it works for Tron, and it works so well. And yes. I didn't think anybody could live up to that, so I'm happy that Daft Punk did a good job on Legacy. Absolutely. What about you, Jeremy? I'm going to be generic and say Star Wars. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no one's mentioned Star Wars. <laughs> oh man, yes, I'm new and fresh and exciting. <laughs> no, I mean, John Williams is a very great composer, so, and you know, I mean, it's very iconic music. You know when some, when you, you, you the storm, stormtroopers are coming, you know stormtroopers are coming, basically. It's like, oh, here you come, here comes stormtrooper music. Yeah. So there's going to be stormtroopers, I those guess. Those themes instantaneously mm. became, like, just, rem- like, memorable, like, like mm-hmm. instantaneously. Yeah. yeah. Like, and yeah. probably worldwide. You could probably go to any country and play that. Yeah, one of those theme songs, and they would know what it's from. There's so many yeah, different like not, renditions of it, and, and stuff. it's not just the main theme that people know. It's the like the the Imperial March. Yeah. It's the the hope the 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 New Hope theme where it's uh, yeah yeah great Duel of the Fates later on. Like one of my favorite pieces of Star Wars. I do music. like it, but I think you put Duel of the Fates too <laughs> too high. <laughs> that was your that was your fourth or <laughs> third one that you brought up <laughs> because it's not from the '80s, John. Oh. It's not. But I wanted 80s. to throw it in. Anything else? <laughs> oh, b- oh, Back to the Future, yeah. Okay, Back nice. Back to the Future yeah. has very good Oh, no music. one's talked about that yet. Back to the oh. Future, huh? It does have very heroic music. I mean, you, you get you really pumped for any... Like, even when just, like, regular stuff's going on, it's like, oh, man, something cool's about to happen because this is going on, clearly. But, yeah, Back to the Future. Absolutely. You know, one of the best things, I think, about Back to the Future and Star Wars is that they have amazing special effects. Oh, yeah. Something really, really big and prevalent in the time in the 80s science fiction. Right, John? Yeah, 80s, we were talking about that earlier. The 80s, not only do we get the introduction of CG more extensively because extensively, it was introduced in the 70s in film, uh, more, it's more extensive in the 80s, and practical effects were really at their peak. You've got uh, Stan Winston, Creature Shop. You have um, Industrial Light and Magic started doing things besides Star Wars. I mean, Industrial Light and Magic is a division of uh, LucasArts or Lucasfilm, but they started doing other things. They did the special effects, for example, in Back to the Future. So, and then you have... Uh, yeah, you just have, again, practical effects are at their peak. And this is before, and I hate to say it, but nowadays, it's just like, just, just doing CGI. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. And before, I think there was more time and care spent on these practical effects. The point would be the thing. Yeah, you could have done that now in CG. And in fact, the thing <laughs> filmed from like, what year is that? 2010, I forget what year it's from. Has got a lot of CG in it. But the practical effects used in the original look amazing. They hold up because they did... It's not it's not like camera tricks or uh claymation they actually built these big elaborate props and did these you know you know mop, you know puppets and stuff like that and just man the oh, holy crap the special effects of the 80s really it was at the peak for practical effects there's some that stand out in your mind you want to talk about goldsmith I know you're uh, you're getting an actor yourself so I figured you would have some insight on this did you see any of this what what big sci-fi you were in Genesis right yeah, like a, Terminator Genesis. D- any special effects? Oh, I thought you meant the band. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> Me and Phil used. To. Yeah. Um, there were, but what, the what scenes it, you weren't in, there weren't any crazy special effects or anything, right? No, it was like, a warehouse with a truck in the middle of it. But they did have to CG out his mustache. <laughs> yeah, they actually CG'd me out. <laughs> I wasn't in the goddamn movie. <laughs> it, it turned it into a montage. What was your question? <laughs> what 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 a uh, eighties science fiction. 
uh, special effects? What stands out in your mind, or which one? Did you one you want to talk about, or is there any directors or uh, special effects <coughs> crew that you want to bring up? Because well, I was just talking about like we talked about. I was talking about Stan Winston, <laughs> Industrial Light, and Magic. Those are probably the big ones. I um, mean, you have uh, Steven Spielberg, but if, again, most of these people outsource. Industrial Light's Magic was involved in so many fucking films. Back to the Future, all the Star Wars films, yeah. all the Indiana Jones <laughs> movies. And they again, they worked on with several other companies um, to help them with their special effects. So why would you do it yourself if you could just count on ILM? Yeah. Well, I didn't go through um, uh, all the companies and stuff like that. But the first thing I think of when I think of effects in the 80s is all the miniature stuff, like with Blade oh, Runner. Yeah. Like Jeremy was talking about earlier, that opening shot where it's going through the city, that's all miniatures. And it looks yeah. gorgeous. And Hoth, look at Hoth. That's all miniatures. And Hoth looks yeah. amazing. The the is it at ats is that what they call them? Yeah, uh, the yeah. Big at, yeah, and they just in the 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 little vehicle is just the snow, and it just it doesn't look like miniatures, man. Yeah, that's really they used miniatures in the in through the nineties, but really they pretty much have stopped. They, there's a handful of movies over the last five or ten years that have used it, and it looks great still. I don't know why more people don't do it. But, I think it's uh, cost. I think there's there's a a craft to it. It yeah. really is, and it's now cheaper to hire two guys that are fresh out of college. I'm not knocking. I know there's a lot of work in CG, yeah. but I'm saying they these guys will work cheaper, and there's the way less overhead involved yeah. in doing it in less CG space. now. Yeah, you're gonna have to have a yeah, big and you can source out it. to a third party too, who <clears throat> who does maybe does all the digital effects in some other and, country and can ship it to you. And then, yeah, speaking of digital effects, wasn't Tron the first, uh, co- maybe not the first, but it was, it was like one of the first movies that didn't have, it had computer animation that wasn't wireframe. Yeah, it was the first use of extensive. <laughs> um, I think the first CG movie, I mean, this is 70s, is Westworld had CG in it, yeah. but that was 2D animation um, and it was CG, but I think it was extensive, not only 3D, but at least Tron had extensive 3D. It wasn't just one little two-second spot Yeah, because Tron... Uh, you know the 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 light cycles, um, the actual uh, I forget the flying things are called. All of a sudden, I should know this because I'm a Tron fan. Um, <laughs> well, in any, any case, it was a quantum leap stuff. forward. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And some people would disagree and say, "Well, it looks really dated, <laughs> even you know now." But pretty big deal back then. Yeah, the first wheel was dated compared to what we have now. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it does. So that was uh, that was our take on. <laughs> <laughs> special effects. I think they've come a long ways, but uh, I think 80s really hit the peak. I was also going to mention, we talked about Stan Winston. He also did, I'm going to throw out uh, Terminator and Aliens and the, I can't remember, I should have looked it up, I can't recall, the, the person who did the special effect on the thing, he ends up getting like physically exhausted. And so Stan Winston comes in and helps finish up the movie and Stan Winston's not credited at all for the film. I should I can't remember again who did the thing because the thing has amazing effects and probably some of the best effects of the '80s. But man, the '80s, we could talk about. We just need an episode to talk about '80s special effects. How about you, Jeremy? There's some uh, <laughs> '80s special effects, or uh, is there teams you want to talk about, or special effects that stand out in your mind? Because that was again, we said it was pretty, pretty big decade for special effects. They come a long way, especially from the '70s to like the pinnacle of practical effects. Uh, um, I do not. I'm not good with names or team names, but some effects I really like are in the thing. Um, the scene one that always stands out to me is the scene where the head, the severed head, sprouts the legs and goes after them. That whole thing is done with a remote control car. Oh yeah, it is. Did, yeah, they put a uh, head prosthesis over, I guess, and all of that's like just mechanical bits that come out of the head. So it's all practical effects, and it's really awesome. Um, I think a fucking nightmare is really yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. it's a really good uh creation i think i mean it's very effective it looks really convincing especially for the time um of course star wars uh really revolutionary like little bits of i guess does star wars even have cg in it isn't that mostly just no there's no cg i, was say, I didn't think it's it, all practical it's all effects. practical yeah so that's really awesome though like they came i mean how much they got out of what they put into it is amazing so oh, yeah and uh back to the future i guess same people industrial light and magic yeah so. but yeah Really awesome. It really, if you look at, uh, say, Return of the Jedi, oh, let's look at Empire, which is 1980, and you compare it to other science fiction or other films from the 80s, or 1980 specifically, they don't hold a candle to Empire. Like, Empire, you could tell that Industrial Light and Magic was leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of these other companies when it comes to uh, special effects. 
Because it just, it's mind blowing, man. It's mind blowing. What about you, Robbie? I'm sure there's some films besides The Thing. I know you're a big Thing fan. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the ones you guys all said. Star Wars, Aliens, I think, in particular, mm. has some really good creature <clears throat> oh, effects yeah. and some good like production design and some stuff like that. Good miniature stuff, too. Absolutely. Blade Runner, though, is probably my absolute favorite. Blade Runner just looks amazing. And that opening shot we keep talking about, some of those models <clears throat> in those miniatures are just like pieces of like washers and dryers and yeah. things from the junkyard and uh, things like that. And just basically from the overall just look at it, and even though we don't typically think of animation as far as special effects, but a lot of... Of 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 high level and new techniques were used in Akira, and that movie looks like just gorgeous to me. I think. Mm. All right, yeah, like like we said though, there's some great special effects in these films. Unfortunately, there weren't always some great special effects on TV, who had uh, a much smaller budget. Absolutely, <laughs> you know, 80s sci-fi television. So on the small screen, so the big screen, they had a lot of cool technology, a lot of great practical effects. But like John was saying, on the small screen, it doesn't always come across the best. But there are some great television uh, products from uh, the 80s in science fiction. Jeremy, what do you think some of them are? Uh, Star Trek. Of course. TNG. Right? TNG. What has... year did TNG start? 87. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, that's really what got me watching any kind of Star Trek. I mean, I went back later on and watched the, just Star Trek. But uh, TNG was what I really... I kept thinking it was later than that. It does look good, though. It looks like Robbie's got the Blu-ray set, and it looks fantastic. Yeah, it holds up uh, even that's, now. Well, that's been remastered. I know, even remastered. Still does I'm look saying good. the original source had to look good. Well, yeah, and the ships are always done with models and all yeah. that yeah, stuff. Really and it just look great, that's, man. I feel like that's, that helps a lot, using models in, uh, for effects. I mean, it keeps whatever the product is, it stays relevant throughout time because it's hard to make... I mean, a model's going to look like a model. CG clearly can look dated as <laughs> as time moves forward. Yeah, I didn't think that really helped. Um, honestly, outside of Star Trek, I can't really think of any. I mean, that's like the pinnacle of probably like television special effects. Uh, Small Wonder, I guess, had a little bit going on. But Small Wonder, <laughs> something you like, eighty yeah. step television I mean, wise. But it's still, I mean, it was a good show. But I mean, the effects were meh. Well, this isn't that's just re- about the effects. It's just about what are your favorite eighty sci fi. I mean, it'd be shows. good for like a sitcom type okay. show. So yeah. I thought. That, <laughs> But uh, Star Trek, definitely. Absolutely. Speaking of Star Trek and definitely, what about you, Justin? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got 80s sci-fi shows, TV. You talked to me the other day, I was a TV guy. You got Star Trek TNG. You got Buck Rogers in the 25th century. You got, I'm going to skip that and come back to it, Red Dwarf, which I've never actually watched any of. Oh, was oh it a yeah, BBC Red Dwarf. Show? It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Knight Rider. But, dude, Quantum Leap. <laughs> I knew Quantum Leap was going to make it in the conversation. Of course. Kind I've of a stretch. I mean, I guess it's a, technically 80. It started in 89. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I was going to yeah. say. It started. The design, the whole show, like the clothes that Al wears well, the yeah, whole yeah, time. Yeah, the decades do definitely blend into the new one. Yeah. Usually, yeah. The early 90s might as well be the 80s. Just like the early 80s <laughs> might as well be the 70s. Their, their vision of the future is so funny because it's not just the future. It's 1999 is where he came from, and it's 10 years ahead of when they made it. So it's not like obscenely ridiculously futuristic. They just wear like weird clothes and shit. <laughs> and they have like his his hand link that Al uses to talk to the computer is like a bunch of those clear different colored Legos that you had yes. just stuck together in a random shape. And like just little weird stuff like that. And he wears like a suit that looks like it's made out of tin foil. Yeah, but okay. it's like a three-piece suit. Something. That was popular, though, in 1999. They called it, right? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, in the they did. 90s. I remember that. <laughs> Robbie had one of those. It was, part of, it was part of the Millennium, the Y2K fever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's going to protect yeah. us. <laughs> they didn't really use Legos for that thing, did they? Yeah, no. I oh. made one out of Legos when I was <laughs> okay. a kid, though. No, they, they used crazy blocks. <laughs> no, it was a light bright. It was a light bright. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, John? Your favorite 80s sci-fi television? Well, uh, he already said TNG. I'm not a huge TNG, but I do like TNG. Amazing Stories, man. It was my favorite shows in the 80s. Oh, yeah. They're not all episodes were sci-fi, but some of them were sci-fi, especially like the aliens who needed a ride home. That kind of, that's, that show, though, honestly, even though they weren't supposed to be scary, some were definitely spooky, but it scared the shit out of me, man. And I misremember a lot of it. I went and watched some, more, some episodes recently. I was like, remember that one where that train comes back and the aliens need to ride home? That's two goddamn episodes. <laughs> my brain puts it together yeah. as one episode. I was a little kid. Scared the shit out of me. And then uh, there was the Twilight Zone show from the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Short-lived Twilight Zone from the 80s. Um, Deservedly so. Max Headroom. That's an 80s show. Yeah. And uh, there was, talk about short-lived, Beyond Westworld. So they did the Westworld in the 70s. There's a sequel called Future World. 
not to be used with the future world movie that's about to come out that has nothing to do with any of that stuff. But there's a show called Beyond Westworld, and I think they they filmed six episodes. I think only one aired before it got canceled. People wanted Westworld. It was not. <laughs> it was Beyond Westworld. What? Was it just like stuff outside of the park? That- yeah, well, these uh, somebody, some evil guy from the park was like making robots and sent him trying to infiltrate the real world with them. He's going to take over the real world had uh-huh. he infiltrated with all these, these, these robots. But again, in theory, it could have been awesome. We don't know. It got cut short. Um, and then uh, uh, Elf, man. Elf. Freaking Elf. I mean, he's an alien. I know it's like a comedy. It's like a sitcom. Alien. And he looks form. like a he looks like an adorable Muppet. Yeah. But it's a science fiction. He's an alien. He's living with people. And right, alien life form. That's what I'm going to say. Alf. Yeah. From Milmac. I love Alf. I love Star Trek: Next Generation. That's my absolute favorite, obviously. But I will also mention Airwolf, <laughs> which is we a were debating fiction. earlier. But yeah, it was a futuristic chopper. So at the time, it was. Yeah. At the time. So anyway, we went from the big screen to the small screen. Now we're going back to the big screen after the break, talking about our top five favorite 80s sci-fi movies of all time here on Pop Culture Philosophers. Hey guys, Rock and Robbie here for Pop Culture Philosophers. I want to talk to you real quick about our Patreon page. That's right, Pop Culture Philosophers is on Patreon at patreon.com slash PCP. There you can help support Pop Culture Philosophers, the podcast, the YouTube channels, all that jazz. You can unlock exclusive content and join our community there where you will get access to PCP After Hours. That's the podcast we do after every single podcast. We leave the mics live for a while, and we release it to our Patreon supporters. We also have a newsletter that gets sent out at least once a week written by myself. A special commentary is available on our Patreon page and lots of other nifty, cool benefits. Check it out at patreon.com slash PCP. Because here at Pop Culture Philosophers, we strive to bring a positive, insightful, and entertaining view on our pop culture, and we need your help to to do that. So thank you very much. Welcome back to Pop Culture Philosophers. We're talking about 80s science fiction. We're going to talk about our favorite films, our top five. These are the ones near and dear to us, the ones that we love. But first, I think Robbie reached out to the social media and you, I think you asked people their favorite sci-fi film, did you not? Yes, I sure did. In fact, speaking of social media, we got a brand new group on Facebook called the PCP Army. So get on Facebook, go to our page, well, you can find it there, <clears throat> or just type in PCP Army. Join the PCP Army, there you get a chance to interact with us, the PCP crew, and our fans. And so far, guys, I've had a lot of fun in this group. But in this group, we ask, we ask on YouTube, we ask on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff, so we're all over the place. We got some great responses out there. From YouTube, we got Comic Guy. What's up, buddy? He said Aliens is his favorite 80s science fiction film. It might make other people's list. It's a great film. Instinct RT said Thing and Tron. Brian Steinert said The Fly. Chris Polk said They Live. Icy Cold Milk also said They Live. Clem Urban said The Thing, Blade Runner, Predator, Aliens, Escape from New York. Damn, your tests are hard. Yeah, they are, dude. <laughs> they are. Every episode. Alicia Marrow said The Thing. Richard Werder said Road Warrior. Paul Edwards said Aliens and The Thing. James Donahoe said Blade Runner, Terminator, Thing, Videodrome, and Robocop. Actually, he gave very particular reasons why. It's really long and kind of pretentious, so I'm skipping it. (laughs) Timothy Gorman, part of the PCP crew, said Star Trek, The Search for Spock. It was my. Oh, the voyage home was the one I was thinking. Who picks that? Good, interesting choice. Yeah, Christopher Lloyd's in that film. (laughs) David Hatch, by the way. We love David Hatch, do we not? We're going to let you say whatever you want. He listed like every movie that came out in the 80s. Now, he said Alien, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, Empire Strikes Back, Robocop, Tron, Escape from New York, and The Thing. Absolutely great movies. And this, these movies that all these people have listed, these, that, that's the reason why we're doing this podcast. There's so many great films in the genre from this decade. And thank you guys for checking us out on Facebook, Twitter, at The PCP Show, at The Rock and Robbie. Um, all over the place, Instagram, YouTube. Thank you guys so much. And don't forget PCP Army on Facebook. So that was your favorite science fiction films from the 80s. Now we're talking about our favorites. We've narrowed it down to five. Which is, this is honestly, and I'm not bullshitting because I do this a lot on the show, the hardest top five I've ever done. Because <laughs> I, I think of 10 that I really love from the 80s. I narrowed it down to eight. And then trying to get down to five. It's like, it's like trying to pick your favorite child. Really. It that was a really thing, hard thing to do. There's such 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 
I mean, there's just so many great films. You know, I don't have 80s. children, but I bet it would be easy to pick out your favorite child. Yeah. I got to figure that, too. Yeah. Mine is actually Justin Goldsmith. <laughs> My parents definitely had a favorite child. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to start with, actually, Jeremy Day. All if right. you give me your top five favorite. Now, these don't have to be award-winning films, but they're the ones that are your top favorite. In reverse order, ones that you love the most, 80s science fiction. Okay, so... Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. For number five. Yes! Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Number five. I think it's a good number five. That's an amazing number five, yeah, right? Yeah, a time travel yeah. movie. It's, it's, a, it's a, a great cast. And it's kind of a comedy. Oh, it definitely is a comedy. But comedy and sci-fi is super awesome. Oh, yeah. And I hope, I really hope they make a third one because they've been talking about it for a long time. And it's I know, coming. Uh, it's coming. Bill and Ted face the music. It's coming. Man. I know, I know um, Keanu Reeves and uh, other actor. Winter something. Winter. Winter or, Soldier. No, what's his name? <laughs> uh, we uh, call him Third Vampire from it, Lost Boys. He is. He's in Lost Boys. <laughs> Yes. I love Lost Boys too, but yeah, um, they were talking about it, and they had that whole like, uh, I guess, interview where they were talking about the movie and everything, and they were talking about that on that. So I'm hopeful, hopefully, Bill and Ted three. Uh, number four is uh, one second. Uh, space Balls. Ah, nice. Space Balls. Maybe so, yeah, top five. I'm doing comedies, man. man we ain't found shit. <laughs> that is yep that's exactly what i want to bring up is that's one of my favorite scenes and the most memorable one of the most memorable scenes to me is when they're combing the desert and like the black guy has the fucking afro pick it's like, <laughs> it's like we ain't found shit i love that amazing um but it's a very funny f- funny movie darth helmet uh Rick moranis oh my the may the schwartz be with you oh man i'm so, so disappointed earlier we talked about villains and no one brought up pizza the hut pizza the hut oh yeah that is a good one. <laughs> Holy crap. he eats himself when he was trapped yes in Dude, he consumes himself this is messed up when i was a kid when every time he showed up and that's john candy right every time no no john no. candy was uh, a yeah, yeah. but, but whenever pizza the hut showed up like dude i wanted pizza yes yeah, sir yeah, no, yeah there's a bunch of pizza it was, bunch so, of- it was so deliciously gooey and yeah. like- <laughs> boss you're delicious <laughs> it was like a pile of pizza of course you're hungry um my number three is uh oh my god uh the thing the thing yeah the solid thing. the thing uh, like I was saying earlier, the practical <laughs> effects are very amazing in that film, and I think that's why it holds up so well. I just like sci-fi horror, and uh, there's a lot of sweet body horror in it too, which is like a cool genre that came out in the that was a big '80s thing. Um, yeah, with that one in Cronenberg. You yeah, know? The, oh yeah, I, we didn't. I don't feel like we talked enough about it. Uh, yeah, Cronenberg. like scanners and scanners, the, yeah. Videodrome, oh, yeah. Fly, yeah. But um, the thing is really awesome. John Carpenter, good, it's a good film. Number two is uh, Aliens. Amazing. I think Aliens yeah. is better than Alien by far. Yeah. I think to me it is. Stay tuned for After Hours for some <laughs> oh, hard okay. words. Okay, for me personally, because, yeah. I mean, there's more aliens. There's aliens instead of, like, one. It's yeah, like, it's plural. And the first one's definitely... They're a, completely different It's films, not like but the they first movie work. lied. It's called Alien. Yeah, it lets you know yeah. what's up. Both movies let you know what's happening. And you're just like, I know what I'm, go- I know what I'm getting into. Alien but, Cubed, it gets confusing, though. I'm like, whoa, that's... It's like that little... Game over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> game over. And, um... My number, uh, your number one, my number one, back to the future, back to the future. <laughs> yep. I thought, I thought we were going to do power of love. Uh, it's the power <laughs> of love. Don't need a credit card to ride this train. Yeah. But it's a good, good movie. Good soundtrack. Oh man. Amazing soundtrack. That movie is good times, man. Very, ref- mm-hmm. very quotable and very referenceable. Like so many shows and comic family guys gotten way too much out of back to the future in star wars <laughs> it's like oh no you've got too much out of these things yeah and you can not be a car guy but if you saw delorean you would know a delorean yeah oh, you, and i wanted one it's, there are there is mm-hmm. a couple here in huntsville that have twin they have deloreans and i think they're they might be physicists because they have like Somebody told me that knows them that they're physicists, so they have. They're twin- working on the flux capacitor. They might, I don't know, but I've seen them around here. They have cool, like personalized license plates and everything. It's dope. But um, <laughs> every Tuesday night they go stand on the toilets to see if they can <laughs> see if they can <laughs> get the thoughts. No, I, mean, I would love a DeLorean. Too bad it's like what only a thousand. Is that how many they made? They made a lot no, more than that. A, a hundred, is it a hundred thousand? Well, I don't know if they made that many. I don't know. There's a very limited amount, but yeah, yeah very very good movie. That's a great top five. <laughs> Thank you. That's a fantastic top five. Thank you. And we'll see if anybody can beat it. And then the winner gets the pool of money in the center of the table. No, no I want that pool of money. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, That's my Michael Myers plushie and Optimus oh, Prime. Nobody toy. gets that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to actually jump over to Goldsmith, your top five 
science fiction films from the 80s. I think we're going to have some... I think we're going to have some... From the 80s. I think we're going to have some uh, crossovers. I think you may have some films that Jeremy picked. Um, n- no. Holy shit. None of those. Oh, eat a dick, Jeremy. If I remember correctly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks for uh, that. My number five is RoboCop. RoboCop. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's a very human story. You know, he what? wakes up after the accident. and <laughs> Accident? He's <laughs> <laughs> fucking br- brutally murdered. Yeah. Like, dude, and that terrified me when I was a dude, kid. Dude, yeah. it's it, man. That's fucking... It's, oh, what's, oh. That, what's the quote? Is it dead or alive, you're coming with me? Yeah. 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 Dead or alive, dead or alive. You're coming with me. Yeah, I love yeah. that story. I love the everything about that movie is great. It's one yeah. of my favorite. And then, like I said, RoboCop's the fucking poster child. Dude, he looks so badass. Eighty sci-fi, if not sci-fi in general, one of them. Yeah, and yeah. a great toy line. Oh, yeah. great toy line! I, so <laughs> many toys. Let's let's take this graphic R movie and make toys for kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my number four is Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it's. I really love the way it ended. Because Such a down note. Yeah. Like life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very Do you steal all your material from <laughs> Kevin Smith? <laughs> yes. Um, it's a great film, though. And honestly, it's probably the most highly rated of yeah. the Star yeah. Wars films. And I love that moment when Luke disappears in dust. It was Luke and, and Leia, but, the, but Han was still there. Oh, never mind. I'm thinking of Infinity War. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, Spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, That's right, you guys. Yeah. If you've not seen Infinity War, Luke Skywalker dies in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just love that. The, the, it's the cheesiest one from the movie, but it's also, you know, I love you. I know. I know. <laughs> it's so, so good. My number three, Escape from New York. Too good. Kurt Russell going into New York, which is a prison now, saving the president's daughter, pres- I think. Yeah, his daughter. Talking about 80s sci-fi villains we didn't mention, Lee Van Cleef in that movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to bring up Bruce Campbell from the second from Escape from L.A., but that was With 90s. That chin? Yeah. <laughs> it made his chin even bigger. Yep. Um, but, yeah, that's one of my favorite movies of all time anyway. It's a so, great film. It's a great, that, it's a great uh, film, man. That, it's uh, got a great soundtrack. I dressed as uh, Snake Plissken for Dragon Con the year before last. That CG that map that they show was actually like, have you seen how they made that map? It's they real. Made, yeah, it's like an actual models that they like lit up. It's it's mind blowing. They put blowing. this like like reactive tape on it yeah. or something. The wire fr- oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it looks wire frame, right. but it was not a CG yeah, at all. I remember that. Yes, that is correct. But a great film. Yeah. My number two. The Deuce. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Ah, I knew Star Trek was going to make it on the yeah. list. I'm surprised there's not more Star Trek. How many Star Trek films were in the 80s? One really good one and a few other good one, decent <laughs> I figured ones. It, I just figured since you're such a Star Trek nut. Yeah. There's four in the 80s, right? There's Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, Voyage Home, and Final Frontier. And Star Trek Electric Boogaloo. I think so. <laughs> Yeah, because Undiscovered Country is the early 90s. Uh, yeah. 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 There's four. four so Star this Trek one makes it... I'm just surprised that it was... I honestly thought your top five was going to be all... Star Trek films? Yeah, well, I have to take a step back when we do these lists, you know, because Star Trek can't take everything. I mean, Voyage Home is fun, but it's not as it's not RoboCop fun. Yeah. Is that the one with the damn whales? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was my favorite one when I was a kid. Because it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. It's so whales whaley. Locally, uh, <laughs> whales are cool. <laughs> Computer. And what was your number one drum roll? My number one should not be a surprise. It's Blade Runner. Blade Runner. I've never seen this film. What's it about? <laughs> <laughs> it's about ice skating. Oh, <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, sound like it could be. A, yeah, or like a, a luge movie. <laughs> One of the best movies of all time. Period. It's, it's a great probably, movie. I think that even the practical effects. I think hold up well. I realized yeah. that in the uh, the final quarter, cut or whatever, they went through and cleaned up some of that and fixed some of it with CG. Mm-hmm. But visually, it's still an amazing film, and it's just a great yeah, film because it's got like. Detective noir stories are some of my favorite to experience, and it's so interesting to uh, take an old style of uh, story and transpose it into a futuristic yeah. world like that. And just some of the coolest things, just like when he's sitting there eating the noodles, and then like there's just people walking by, and he's reading a newspaper. Just really simple stuff like that that I really love about it. And it's got one of the best soundtracks of all time. 
the effects, the world they built, everything. That's why one Ridley Scott is one of the greatest directors and why we did a Ridley Scott podcast. If yeah. you listen to this and you missed it, you should check it out. Mm-hmm. Listeners, Ridley Scott. It was a good one. Yeah, it's great. Great list. Great top five. <laughs> that is a good top five. Thank you. Now I'm curious to hear Robbie's top five. I know he's going to have like five runner-ups. So let's hit me with the runner-ups first. I don't have any <laughs> honorable <gasps> mentions. If I wanted to give an honorable mention, <laughs> God damn it. I would give it to Brazil. Which I haven't seen in probably like 12 years. So I, it wasn't fresh enough on my mind to actually include it in my top five, but it is a very cool it's world awesome. that's built. Yeah. It's a great film. Terry Gilliam's such a great director. Part of well. the Dreamer trilogy that he did with Time Bandits and uh, was it The Adventures of Baron Munchausen yeah, or whatever. Exactly. It. So. Number five, and I'm just going to say this four out of my five are all from the same year, the greatest year in cinema history. Um, number five is from 1982. It's Star Trek: The Wrath of Khan. Khan. That movie is amazing. It's great. They really were able to capture the feel and tone of Star Trek, but still make it very, very for the first time, truly very like appealing to a wide audience. Yeah. And I'm disappointed nobody mentioned Khan earlier in the villain yeah, segment. Yeah. Yeah. He he is a great villain, Ricardo Maltabon, mm. and, re- <clears throat> and reprising a role from just a random episode yeah. of the original series. <laughs> And it's a great film with great performances. Um, the ending, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the God. needs of the few. And seriously, it breaks my heart every time. We watched that at the theater for the Fathom event. Yeah. And it just... Uh, that was... I'm so glad we went and did that. Me too. I hope they do Search for Spock next year. Yeah. I On hope the so. voyage home. Absolutely. <laughs> Number four is from 1984. And it is uh, directed by W.D. Richter. It stars Peter Weller. And it's The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth <laughs> Dimension. I, I love this that. movie so much. Speaking of awesome villains, John Lithgow in that movie is a great villain. Have you ever seen this movie? No, You've uh, never seen one it. Of the one, that was the one that I wanted to watch so before this. I love it. It is corny. It is campy. It is cheesy. Jeff Goldblum is dressed as a cowboy in it. And they're like, why are you dressed as a cowboy? And he said, just dress casually. Meaning that he, this dude just dresses as a cowboy. <laughs> and it's just so hilarious, so preposterous. I love the idea of the science hero. And it takes the fun of that. And it, and it makes this really cool just interesting hero this really it's just such a it's just such an oddball movie and it just i love it man it really fits my personality number three comes from 1982 it is a movie that instilled in me a very uh a very good um at an early age a, a good healthy dose of of mistrust and fear of the government it's et the extraterrestrial i love this movie <clears throat> i loved it when i was a kid um reese's pieces are the shit um drew barrymore is adorable in this movie the kid that play what's the kid's name is it Billy? Well, no, that's Gremlins. What's the kid's name? Elliot. 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 Yeah, Elliot's yeah. The kid. I don't know. That's why I said name. Billy because I, I was thinking Billy Elliot was the name of the kid. <laughs> I was like, that can't be right. No, I love that movie, man. That movie. Talk about like wanting to tear up during Wrath of Khan. No, every time in ET. I recently rewatched that movie and I forgot how sad that movie gets towards like the end of Act Two, beginning of Act Three. Like ET is dying in front of us, man. It is so sad, and it's got such a great theme, and it's a great movie for all ages, and I love it. Number two is from 1982, and it's The Thing. The John Carpenter film, basically a remake of The Thing from Another World, a Howard Hughes film. Uh, Howard Hawks, not Howard Hughes. <laughs> um, but I, I love The Thing. It's great. It's great uh, the way that they, they show and display paranoia and this fear and this mistrust, and they make it like palpable, right? You can, you can feel it oozing off. Great performances from Kurt Russell, um, Kevin James. No, Kevin J. I always do Keith <laughs> David. Keith David. <laughs> Paul Blart. <laughs> wow. Paul Blart. Yeah. No, it's because it's, it's it's two first names, man. I always I always do this. But Keith David, um, they're amazing. That movie. I love the way it ends. Is is any of them infected? Is it whiskey? Is it gasoline? What's going on at the end there? I love the idea that both of them they're not infected. They're just going to sit there and they so don't trust each other. They're just going to sit there and die. And I just I love that. That movie's so great. Number one is from 1982. It's Blade Runner. Yeah. Blade Runner is amazing. I'm a huge Philip K. Dick fan. Love his work. Um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a great uh, novella and has some really interesting ideas. And Ridley Scott took that the the very thin idea of the replicants and this this future and made this amazing vision of it. And it's 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 a, it's a visual treat. It's an uh, it's it's a it's a cinematic treat. It's it's beautiful music all throughout. It looks gorgeous. It sounds great. It's got a great feel and a tone. And it's one of the most complex science fiction stories I've ever, ever had the joy of experiencing. And that's my top five, man. I think we did an 80s. Man, I can't remember what else we did. And it showed up on your number one. I can't remember the list. 
It was Life the, of Me. Ri- the Ridley Art- Scott podcast. Oh, Ridley Scott podcast. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Ba- and back in the SOE days when we did our science fiction episode, it was the number one there, too. All right. Yeah. So not too much has changed. Mm. Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. It's a of great all time. film. I think it holds up well. I think it's got a great cast. I think, you know, great director. It's really Scott, man. It's really Scott. So that was your top five. I'm going to jump into my top five real quick. If anybody gives a shit, nobody Please probably do. does. Do. Everybody do. else is tuned out by now, but I, everybody else still listening, I, we appreciate it. Uh, my top five, starting a. I'm actually going to do a runner up. And this was a movie, <laughs> uh, an honorable mention. So this movie, I wanted to put in my top five, but honestly, I like the original war. And that's The Fly. I love the a classic movie, and I do like the 80s film. It was definitely the first film that made me want to throw up. Seriously, <laughs> this movie made me want to, I don't know if it was when he was transforming, or maybe when he, maybe he throws up on his food so he can eat like a fly, but there was a scene that I, I was a kid, and I saw this, and I was like, oh my God, I'm, I seriously thought, I, I might have actually thrown up now that I think about it. Um, and I do like the movie, and it's very terrifying, and I think Jeff Goldblum does a great job. And uh, I like the movie, but again, I love the original so much. And the original doesn't even have the flying it much. You know what I'm saying? Most of the time he's covered up. And when you do see him, he's got, why does he have a crab hand? Anybody, nobody fucking has a crab <laughs> hand in the movie. Anyway, we get to my actual top five. Number five, this showed up on somebody else's list, Back to the Future. Great soundtrack. Yeah. I enjoy the sequels. I love the first one. It's a great standalone film. Um, great music, great cast. I love Christopher Lloyd. Well, you can't go wrong Back to the Future. Number four, Blade Runner. I love Blade Runner, man. It's a great film. It was hard not to move it up higher up on my list, but there's yeah. some films I just enjoy more. Uh, and it may change. Blade Runner may be number two next week. Who knows? But I do like Blade Runner. This was a hard five, to, a hard top five to nail down. Uh, number three is going to be The Thing. You know, it's just great visual effects. It's terrifying. And it really gives you that sense of cold. I mean, really, it's just like you want to bundle up watching the film, even if you're, you know, even if it's 100 degrees out. It feels yeah. cold. It's one of my favorite movies to watch when the AC goes out. Yeah. What? That oh, because it yeah, yeah, that and Alive. <laughs> uh, Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's a movie that f- fucked me up oh when I was a God. kid, too. I'm just yeah. going to be honest with you. <laughs> I feel you. I remember uh, watching that in my parents' bedroom because they had borrowed it from, on, I mean, they had rented it on from like a blockbuster or something yeah. on VHS. And I, this is not a, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I watched it Alive by myself. And dude, it's just. How <laughs> old were you then when you think you watched it? I was probably like eight, nine or ten. Yeah, that was probably too young. <laughs> <laughs> I was the same way, man. It's so kind of a deep movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my parents, uh, my mom was very picky about what we'd watch. My stepdad didn't care. So if she was out, he'd let us watch. Now, he wasn't letting us watch stuff with like graphic nudity, but he didn't think scary films were that big a deal. So we watched Friday the 13th, stuff like that. I thought you said you didn't watch things with graphic nudity. <laughs> oh, I guess Friday the 13th does have nudity. <laughs> I was I thinking graphic. like... Graphic. I was thinking like... <laughs> I was thinking just like, you know, horror films in general. Um, number two... Return of the Jedi. That's my favorite Star Wars film. I know the Empire's uh, probably has more highly regarded. But Jedi was just a bunch of Muppets. God damn it. <laughs> it's got the speeder bikes. It's got the happy ending, even though, spoiler alert, Vader dies. <laughs> even though you don't want him. I mean, you want him to die. He's the bad guy. But the way it happens, and the whole thing is hard. spoilers, man. like 20, 30 years later, the First Order comes out and <laughs> it gets fucked up again. Pretty dark. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pretty dark. Pretty bad. Pretty dire straits. Currently in the Star Wars universe, in there. Mm-hmm. Or Sultan of Swing, the Sultans of Swing. And my number no, one. No, but you like Jedi over yeah. Empire. Yeah, I yeah. do like Empire. Do you write those bikes though? That scene on, dude, on the speeder Indoor? bikes, dude, that's amazing. Dude, visually it was amazing. I really like their costumes too. I love the speeder bike, the speeder, the scouts, scout are the biker scouts. I have the coolest costumes. Although the least aerodynamic mask of everybody. The toaster <laughs> face? Yeah. The toaster face yeah. mask? You're talking, that's I what love it looks those, like. The, the actual <laughs> Stormtrooper helmets are actually already aerodynamic. Yeah, Why and would they you went to a less <laughs> for the speeder bike. <laughs> Who knows? And they're terrible with those bikes, by the way. They're fucking just incompetent. But uh, <laughs> I love that movie. So, And just having Luke come back and be such a badass. I love so much about that movie. Boba Fett, you get to see two seconds of him. <laughs> Yes. But you, just, you get to see him at least use his fucking jetpack finally. He's worn it the whole time. Like, use a jetpack. Apparently, he doesn't know how to use it very well. No, because he falls into the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> and my number one favorite, which in my opinion is the greatest science fiction film of all time, Tron. Oh, wow. What a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think so, you were going to mention it. Also from 1982. Also from 1982, uh, talk about Great World, Steven Lisberger, who gave us the 
the Tron world. It's just visually, it's a stunning. It looks gorgeous. Yeah, man. it's and everybody I talk to, uh, my friends from they grew up in that era. Their favorite sci-fi film generally is going to be uh, Star Wars, but mine happened to be Tron. Something different about Tron. It just spoke to me as a kid. Uh, maybe because I was in a computer for a while. <laughs> but no, I love I, I love Tron, dude. The identity disc, the light cycle. I love how that took us all a second. <laughs> I, there's something about it, man. I just love Tron. I, I want a light it. cycle, man. Yeah, we rented it about 50 times on RCA Selectivision, which was those giant fucking floppy disk that I think the, I think you're familiar the with. The CEDs? It. Yeah, the CED. RCA marketed is like Selectivision, and yeah. we'd rent that. And it was disappointing because VHS was just coming out, and we had you know we had to choose between VHS and that. And we were using that at the time. We were renting that because they had more selection of movies where we used to go to, which is a movie store slash pizza store. Huh. And uh, we used to rent that. And I remember renting Star Wars. I remember renting uh, uh, Tron and just watching those over and over again. Loved them. But Tron's my favorite of all time. Tron is... And any, I'll fight anybody who doesn't who says there's a better sci-fi. Who, <laughs> who was the the owner of the company or whatever in the original Tron he had the big, huge black desk with the that, computer built into it. That was William Randolph Hearst. That Sark <laughs> is the computer guy's name in the computer world, but the actor is David Warner, who plays the bad guy. He's the like the CEO yeah. that stole the yeah, code. Yeah, yeah. That desk is one of the coolest pieces. Yeah, that desk from is awesome, and that's similar to the ever. desk in Tron Legacy when he he finds the yeah. desk, hidden desk. Yeah, and it's the but, same desk that uh, Barack Obama had in the Oval Office. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's why he was mm-hmm. such a good president. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. If it's an evil desk, wait a minute. I don't. I don't know, I don't know what's going on. It's here. not the desk. <laughs> yeah, it was the master. But uh, it was master control program that was ultimately the evil thing that Tron the had to go and fight. Yeah. So I, I love that man. I love everything about that movie. And yes, it's definitely dated, but I think it's just. I think it holds up well. Sound, visual. Like I love it. If you have a chance, check it on Blu-ray. They had restored it, and it looks and sounds better than ever. And that arcade is badass. Yeah, they need to have oh, yeah. some of those like around the country. That'd be a cool chain, Flynn's Arcades. Yeah, dude, we kind of almost have one with Pines and Pixels. I mean, it's almost yeah. like walking into that same yeah. type place. Yeah. So next episode, we're gonna do fantasy. Drew's gonna be joining us again, and Brooks. They're super happy that we're finally doing yeah, this. This is doing what, a fantasy two epi- two years in the making. <laughs> this podcast. We're talking about films. I think we're probably talking about books. We might talk a little bit about D and D, but we're talking about all things fantasy and. uh if you're listening to this show and you're checking out us on the website, did you know you can just uh, download it instantly? You can subscribe with Android and with iTunes. And if you're subscribing, come on down to the site. There's a whole lot more on there. There's uh, blogs. There's podcasts. There's videos. Robbie does a weekly comic book review. Check us out on the YouTube channel. There's a lot more content on there, probably more than anything else. More than anything else, more content. <laughs> I'm just saying, you do. Robbie does the weekly comic review. I also do a pop culture wrap up. There's a bunch of stuff. Movie Monday. There's a lot of uh, content on the YouTube channel, so come check that out. And of course, be sure to join us for PCP After Hours. We're going to be recording that right after we wrap up this show. It's available to our Patreon supporters. That's Patreon.com/slash PCP. So I really appreciate everybody being here, everybody listening as well. 80 Science Fiction. It was amazing. I love 80 Science Fiction. Justin, thank you for being on the show. No problem. I appreciate everything. What are your final thoughts on 80s sci-fi and why people should care? Because it's 10 years of really good movies, period. Like, it's a, it's a genre in a decade I don't know, ever man. done so well. 81 was a rough year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like most, You can pretty much pick any sci-fi movie from the 80s, even the crappy one. Like Tracers. We watched part of it earlier. It's bad, but I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Why should people care about 80s sci-fi? Because there is a lot of 80s sci-fi from, or that's just good from that era, just the 80s. Sick. <laughs> it's a good time for sci-fi. If you think about sci-fi movies, I'm sure there's a good chance it's from the 80s, straight up. And also the thing is from that, and Back to the Future, the best movie ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Don't take money. It's not the best movie ever, but it's great. Don't take money. Don't take fame. <laughs> I love it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and 80 science fiction is awesome because it's finally, like, it's just it's just the best. And 1982 in particular, I, if you take one thing from me, if it's from 1982, it's pretty much a surefire hit here at PCP. Oh, it is, man. What a great, de- what a great decade, but what a great year for films in particular. 
You know, and I think we even have plans of maybe doing a podcast specifically about that year eventually. About 82. 1982. But like John said, next episode, PCP Fantasy. Looking forward to it. It's all about fantasy sports. Wait, no, that's not true at all. <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, we're excited about that episode. Tune in next time. Check out Fantasy. Unless we do something else. And skip. <laughs> no, we'll do Fantasy. I'm, <laughs> I, but I'm hyping up the listeners, and so we know have what? to do it. You know it. what? Screw it. Let's just do basketball movies. <laughs> It's I can the finals. Hear, I can hear Drew's Jimmy's being rustled from <laughs> 10, 20 miles away. <laughs> we appreciate you guys tuning in. And uh, again, next episode, check out Fantasy. Like I said, check out a whole, more, whole lot more content on the website. And we will catch you next episode. To quote the great Tron, end of line. Yeah.